Um, this morning with me, my guest is a financial analyst and Clico shareholders representative, Mr. David Walker. Welcome and thank you for being here this morning. The issue that we're dealing with is Clico, of course. Three CARICOM countries are seeking answers as to why their countrymen and women who are shareholders in Clico have not received any monies since their collapse back in 2009. It raises issues here at home as stakeholders and policyholders alike await returns on their investments. Now, remember, governments would have inter interjected some $20 billion to save the company, but it's not letting go until taxpayers' dollars are repaid. Senior consultant at Alcinda Walker and Associates is David Walker, and he's president of the Clico Shareholders Alliance. Welcome and good morning good, again. Good morning to you. Good so, morning. first of all, these CARICOM countries, such as Barbados, St. Vincent and Grenada, they are now calling on the Trinidad and Tobago government, asking them to do the same that it had done for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So my first question is, is Trinidad and Tobago basically um, bound to this? My understanding, firstly, is that with respect to these other countries and their citizens, there are two separate issues, and I think we should sort of delineate between the two issues. One is that there were other CLECO institutions of the islands, which were legally separate and distinct from CLECO Trinidad and Tobago. So logically, the government of Trinidad and Tobago in bailing out CLECO Trinidad had no obligations towards those. Then there were the citizens of those other countries, some of whom invested not in their island, but in CLECO Trinidad. And in the bailout, they were treated differently from citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And I my understanding is that that is at the heart of the current issue. So that if, for example, you had a cousin from Jamaica who had invested in Clico Trinidad, just as you had done, what happened was that you got some relief, whereas your cousin from Jamaica did not, although they invested in the same company. And there has been a promise long standing that this would be resolved to the satisfaction of all, which presumably means that they would get the same terms and conditions as those who were resident in Trinidad and Tobago. And my understanding is that that is the issue that the other uh, heads of state were raised um, a few days ago, to which the Prime Minister responded effectively, saying that he recognized that um, there, there was a liability which they will honor, but asking for time to do some further examination of the books and, and the state of play at the moment. He then went on to deal with other matters locally, totally unrelated to the, the uh, CARICOM citizens' business. So we, we could get into that as well. Exactly. But the, the core issue that they raised mm -hmm. was about their citizens who had invested in Clico Trinidad. Now this question basically brings to the fore the Treaty of Chagaramas. And I quote, it says that no CARICOM country should favor its citizens over another once it is a regional issue now. Do their argument now have more weight and what position do are we here in Trinidad and Tobago would be placed? Well, I don't, I don't even know that it's necessary to, to rely on that. Straightforward companies' law would tell you that if 10 people have the identical contract with a company and for some reason they, they needed to be treated differently, the contract terms needed to be changed, for example, then everybody should be treated the same. So under straightforward company law and, and you know, equity and people's sense of fair, fair play, I think virtually everybody would agree that if 50 people had policies with Clico for a million dollars each, they should receive the same treatment as long as they were depositing the money with the same Clico Trinidad Limited. So I don't know that we even know to need to go to that treaty. It's interesting in that it, it opens the door to another discussion about the interaction between the island states within the Caribbean. And maybe it provides an opportunity for us to examine that because we, you know, we talk about further regional integration and maybe this is a segue, if you like, into really examining how it works in practice. But I don't think in practical terms with the clico matter that it's actually quite relevant. Um, in his response, the Prime Minister mentioned at the uh, intercessional, the CARICOM intercessional meeting there in Grenada last week, he responded by essentially saying he wished not to address the matter at a CARICOM level, however, at a bilateral level. Do you think that was an appropriate move by him? I don't understand, frankly, what he was getting at when he said that. Because, as I just explained, it, it's a matter to do with Clico Trinidad Limited. 
I can understand if we were taking some responsibility from, for the other clicos. If, if that were the case, I could understand the need for that bilateral type of arrangement and negotiation. But if all we are doing is looking at monies owed by Clico Trinidad, then I really don't understand the need for that approach. So in, in looking at this situation, we are seeing that government would have interjected 20 plus billion dollars into this uh, Clico situation here through three administrations. So we would have had the Patrick, Adma uh, Patrick Manning administration, yes. inherited by the Kamal Passad, the Sasa administration, and now into the new PNM government. Uh, why do you think, or is it true to say that they are trying to keep stakeholders from taking back control of the, the CL Financial and Clico? Why? Well, it appears to be fairly clear that they do not wish to return control of the company to the former shareholders. They have hinted at reasons but never given any publicly. I would like to know what is the reason. Because surely if you rescue something or somebody, the intention is to make them whole, make, get them better, and then return them to whatever state they were in previously. It surely is not the case that when we say we're going to rescue our company, and this, this, ha this bodes for the future as well, if the government says it's going to rescue our company, are the directors and shareholders of that company are to assume then that the government is really going to take over the company and they will never see their company again? Because if that is the precedent, it's going to have far-reaching implications for how we deal with difficulties within the economy in years to come. My view, my personal view, and I've expressed this from day one, is that the rescue should have been about restoring the company to health and putting it back into the private sector with clear agreements as to the repayment of government funds, but also with, with clear indications of how much money the government has spent. To this day, we don't know. We get ballpark figures. We even had the Minister of Finance, I, I don't know, maybe about a year ago, saying that he had two divisions that were giving him different figures for the same thing. Now, that for me is the best example of the level of incompetence in running the company. Because here you are as the person who's putting out the funds. So you're the government, you're signing the checks to say this is the money to help Clico. You're also running Clico, so you're receiving the funds. So you're paying out, you're receiving, and you still don't know how much has been advanced and how much is due. If you're looking for a definition of incompetence, there, there it is. Okay, but, but on the flip side, we're hearing that uh, the government is taking or making efforts to resist any attempts by the Clico shareholders to have them expelled from the board of directors at Clico. Um, first of all, can the government really be expelled? The short answer is yes. Um, not with respect to Clico, but with respect to CL Financial, as things stand presently. Remember the Section 44 control, which is the Central Bank Act that gave them control of Clico, does not apply to CL Financial. CL Financial was being managed under the terms of the MOU, which has expired. The MOU Memorandum of Understanding for, you know, for, for people's edification. Um, that has expired. It had been renewed continuously every three months for years. And you know, there's a little parallel here in that we, we, we're almost seeing a modus operandi from successive governments that are prepared to go along with these short-term arrangements because we had it recently with the cargo boat where they went along with a short-term arrangement and never saw fit to address the issue and come up with a permanent solution. And I'm seeing it here again. They're quite happy to go along with these short-term renewable, renewable. When you know that the day it ends, you're going to have a massive problem. So deal with the problem early on. The only way to deal with the problem, really, is to sit with the, with the shareholders who do have rights and come to an arrangement. What I am hearing from shareholders is the government simply refuses to talk to them. Now, if they're refusing to talk to the policyholders, and if, as the Prime Minister is saying, that he is not going to allow them to regain control, why doesn't he just come out and say, we nationalize the company? We're not giving you back the company. Put the cards on the table, because that is the obvious implication and I've seen that that uh, position has been taken in an article in the newspapers this morning. Tell us what the position is. If, it is of, if you are of the view that these people operated so badly that they should never get hold of the company again, just come out and say so. Okay. Also, it brings into to the question um, the memorandum of understanding that you mentioned, that the yes. government is basically <coughs> willing to have um, consultations on, so hopefully to have a new memorandum of understanding, which uh, expired last year sometime. Yes. 
What is the delay? Where, where is the clique of shareholders uh, well, in well, this? My understanding, and I am not privy to all the details of the discussions, I do speak with shareholders, I speak with policyholders, I speak with all parties, I even speak informally with people in government. My understanding is that the government really has refused to, to take on that long-term position. All they are interested in doing is to do another three months or another six months. And the shareholders have said, after eight years, it's time to, for us to work out what the exit strategy is for this rather than go along with a temporary solution. You could do that for the first two, three years. Eight years is extraordinarily long. So they are asking for a permanent solution. You know, where are we going? So now we're hearing uh, Mr. Lawrence Dupree basically throwing his hat back into the ring, asking that, um, you know, if it's possible for him to resuscitate the regional conglomerate. How do you feel about that? I hold views that some would consider radical. I believe very strongly if you look at track record, that CL Financial became the most diversified conglomerate in the region, and certainly in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, if we are saying as a nation that we are interested in diversification and we want to, to get the economy more diversified, in fact, that we need to get the economy more diversified, we're not going to achieve that by vilifying the one person who has given us methanol holdings, um, CL Marine and so on. I am not saying that he should be put up on a pedestal, but I, see, I feel we have to recognize from a corporate standpoint what he has achieved and give credit for that so that we can hopefully inspire others to do the same. Now let me just carry on the discussion a little bit from there. My great um, criticism of how Mr. Dupre went about what he did, which I said had the right result, was that he used what I consider to be the wrong source of finance to do it, which is short -term, relatively short-term finance, essentially from policyholders' money going in into long-term investments. But you see, that's a reflection of our economy. Our economy has no long-term risk capital available. If somebody wanted to do a methanol holdings or so again now, there is no risk capital available. So I feel we need to be addressing that the, the lack of availability of risk capital in the economy in order to support diversification as the key lesson alongside the failures of the regulator, which is another story. Okay. Well, um, just really quickly, one final question. The Prime Minister is basically asking for more time. He's saying that there are developments with the CLECO issue, and he's you know, requesting some more time. Are you aware of these developments? No, I'm not aware of those. All right. Of so, those so I just switch And, and if I could just get 30 seconds, please. I just want to say something quickly about Tobago. Yes, yes. In the upcoming yes. week, we have the Heritage Festival. I know somebody is going to be talking about yes. it later. And let me implore all the parents with their kids come over for the Heritage Festival, and if I can invite you to do two things. It is to go to the Moriah Old Time Wedding mm -hmm. on the 24th and Charlottesville on the 26th. You're very passionate about Tobago. Absolutely. So you're we looking forward so to so much events. to offer. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't we look forward to, just to give us a little peep into it? The, the Moriah Old Time Wedding really is a play with all the village intrigue okay. built in. So you have the, 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 the good character, you have the, the villain, but it's also part of a whole day of festivity. So it's not just the reenactment of the wedding. It's, yeah. it's a whole thing. Um, what visitors might call a street parade, what we will call a jump up. Yeah. And then there are lots of other activities. And in Charlottesville, the, one of the reasons I, I particularly like the Charlottesville um, day out is that it covers so many things. You see, th th there's a dirt oven. So you can actually buy bread out of the dirt oven yes. afterwards. The juice cane in the old fashioned way. They have an old manual sawmill. So you see life as it was yes. back in the day. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. And we